to ContraSense, a podcast exploring current issues and new research from the social sciences. I'm Maria, and together with my colleague Caro, we'll be discussing night work. This is also an episode about labor, about migrant lives, and about visual anthropology. But first, let's take a step back and just say, we do live in very hard to understand times. It's 2021. There's still a global pandemic ongoing, together with all the social injustices it worsens, and the unfolding climate crisis. I'm not saying this to be a doomer, but just to realize that the challenges we are facing are very complex, and that we do believe sociology, anthropology, and other social sciences and humanities can help us go through the challenges facing us. On that note, you might have noticed our podcast episodes are getting out more sparsely. Well, it's not just pandemic fatigue, it's that many of us six graduated, so some of us moved and we're not in the same city anymore. Plus, some of us are working, and work work lives are not like student lives, as you probably know. But we're still here, slowly working on new episodes. (laughs) Quite slowly. We've recorded this episode in November 2020. So if you want to support us, please share and react to our podcast, because that's how social media works. Leave a comment, an iTunes review, send it to your best mate. We even have a Patreon if you feel generous. Our guest today is Dr. Julius Caesar McGuire. He writes on nightwork and embodied precarity. He founded the Night Workshop, a laboratory to research nightwork in cities like Budapest, Istanbul, London, Milan, Moscow, Prague, and Sofia. He intends to carry out research in Romania's larger cities, such as Bucharest, Brasov, Cluj-Napoca, Iași, and Timisoara, and continue his long-term project to make visual stories about invisible migrant night workers. He is a star UBB research fellow based at the Center for Population Studies. This exploratory phase of his project investigates urban inequalities through a focus on the lived experiences of night shift workers. He wants to extend a special thanks to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Science and Technology at the Babesh Boya University for the star UBB generous support in this phase of his research. After some technical difficulties with our recording, we kicked off the conversation with a discussion about the embodied aspect of our digital lives. And I asked our guest if he considers his work part of the anthropology of the body. Well, I'm glad that you you, uh, pointed out on this aspect. I mean, it's one of those points by way of introduction I I would like to make. And this is one of those points is that the research that I do so far, at least uh, as we spoke before the pandemics, it's uh, an embodied kind of research that provides insight into a mode of laboring that is often invisible. And it's hard for the ethnographer to access through interviews and other classical journal research. And just to illustrate, in 2015, I did night ethnography in a wholesale market called New Spitalfields, which is a wholesale market of fruit, vegetables, and flowers, one of the largest in the UK. And I worked and shared the same precarious conditions as my co-participants for that entire year of research. And the embodied research focused on the bodily experience of work. Following the research, I argued that migrants' workers' subjectivity is not simply expressed through discourse, but in bodily responses to a regime of discipline that seeks to extract as much as possible, as much use from that laboring bodies, at the end of it, leaving them exhausted and spent. And there's this dialectic between this you know, disciplinary power and the techniques of bodily management that constitutes this migrant worker subjectivity. So just to unpack that a little bit. So it's regime of discipline in terms of working hours, in terms of intensity, uh, in terms of how bodies are exhausted by the sheer amount of hours the workers have to be up and alert during the night while rest of the society sleeps. And their role is to provide food. And this is one of the most if you want fundamental forms of work, providing food. So while others sleep, um, these workers are up and exhausted because the rhythm of, of work is so intense that by the end of those, on average, you have 11 hour shifts, right? But I would stay up 16 hours throughout the night because say there was a late delivery and you would be expected that you stay there at no 
say, uh, over time, extra pay or any other incentive, you were told to stay. And the those who didn't, whom I haven't met there because those who objected were uh, seen anyway as expendable. So therefore, they would they would be replaced. So either they left of their own accord or they were replaced by others who, uh, because of their uh, circumstances and conditions there, they were eager to take the place immediately of, of people who were in front of them. So it's often a disturbing account that I'm talking about and describing in terms of this level of precarity. So often precarity is discussed in terms of un, you know, unstable income, uh, in terms of no contractual terms. And, but the kind of account that I'm talking that, that leads into the understanding of contemporary capitalism is, is that it documents how this attempts to discipline these bodies and, and turn them into what I call bioautomatons, which are these human bodies turned into machines who work all night and because of the intensity and, and requirements of that sheer difficult physical work, you could also call these bodies disposable bodies. And I guess um, this, is, this is disturbing in the sense that you see the, uh, the level at which some bodies, you would say, are, are disinvested for the purpose of other bodies. And other bodies that are fostered and taken care of are these you know, highly paid uh, chief executives who can't afford their tight schedules to be moved at all. And, and so everything has to be done. So their business lunches have to be uh, provided, you know, uh, night cleaners have to clean the offices um, so that when they come in, everything is clean. Uh, and, and for them to shift millions across borders in global cities like London. So I guess that's uh, where this kind of um, embodied precariousness provides this insight into uh, today's capitalism form of extracting as much labor from these bodies. It's one strand of my research. And, and then there's another one where, if I may go on um, to explain how these conditions of migration. So, so far we've been talking about night workers and these night workers in global cities mostly are, mostly are migrants. This is how this research li links into these conditions of migrations in terms of the demands that global cities in post-industrial countries demand and rely upon. And, and you, so you have this you know, political process in, in contemporary UK that leads to marginalization of this work work in migrants. And so in these conditions, you know, my research focuses on, on these worker subjectivities in relation to, and, and these encounters between the uh, disciplinary power and the, the, the regimes, the migration regimes. And, and an example of this is this hostile environment in the UK, which is Theresa May's legacy. Um, basically, since policies and regulations were implemented around 2016, though, Others argue that it's, it's, they started somewhere in 2012, 2013. And so the UK government's you know, dominant political rhetoric has been focused on portraying migrants as villains and tabloid media exacerbated it by tenfold through scaremongering. So, so much so that what you see is that you have these street level bureaucrats, as Lipsky would, would call them, is these officials um, and people like doctors and, and people like so, social workers and these people would provide the street level services and through their everyday practices they, they would implement you know, government's uh, regulations and, and impact on, uh, on the everyday basis um, and the lives of, of, of migrants. So you see in this way how you know, doctors and employers turn into border guards. And, and that's one way of, of also looking at how these you know, conditions of migrations and, and political processes affect the lives, the everyday lives of, of these migrants, whom I, I argue that in, in the case of night workers, they are mostly invisible. You get a night worker who is, as I mentioned earlier, exhausted and spent, and the last thing they need or they want uh, is to learn a new language because without 
having access to language, it's very uh, difficult to access a better working place on better contract. You know, the last thing you want to do is to learn English language or any other language. So that's, in a sense, this other strand in, in my work. Yes, I think you you went in um, all the many directions that, that your work tries to touch on. That is, of course, this work that happens at night, the precarity, the migration, the question of language and the question of bodies. And what I really found fascinating... Uh, about your work uh, was of course this focus on the body that that and on the embodiment that can also be seen because you also do visual anthropology but also just by how much you stayed and worked there and I wanted to ask you uh, if you could say again how long you worked there and uh, I remember from one of your films you said you lost weight and what were the effects on your body yes thank you so I did this night ethnography for one year, as I mentioned earlier, and um, eight months of that year, uh, roughly speaking, eight months, I was working six nights per week in this market, and I was a loader, loading fruits and vegetables for grocery store uh, owners who would come to the market from midnight onwards, and they would stay there three, four hours, load their trucks, go back, load the shelves, be ready for uh, morning customers with fresh and fruits and vegetables. And as part of my eight months there, I was embedded in it, into this market and I spent those hours of, of serving customers very uh, highly intensive uh, rhythm. And that rhythm, it impacted in my body and my sleep, on my emotional um, being, so firstly, I gradually noticed how I lost weight and uh, I've never identified it whether that was a combination, uh, combining these factors of very intense. So when I say intense, I mean in a night, being that, that I wasn't an experienced worker who could move faster, who could carry. I mean, my body is not, you know, is not um, equipped to lift up like my colleagues did two, three tons. So in one night, you would lift up two, three tons on your body. I would perhaps do somewhere like 500 kilos and lifting up all these uh, products and, and setting them up on a pallet, putting them on the track and so on. And because of the intensive style of work, uh, coupled with the fact that I... I started to uh, sleep less and less in the day. So we have it clear. As a night worker, you sleep in the day and uh, you can kiss goodbye your eight, seven hours or 10 hours, depending on what you need. These physiological rhythms, they change as a night worker because the circadian rhythms have a peak and a trough and then you have the nadir point, which is the lowest part, the lowest point in this 24-hour physiological clock. And in my case, this physiological point, which was the lowest, was somewhere around between four and six. And, and, and between four and six, uh, I had customers and I still have to be up and serve and I'd be alert and pay attention to their orders and be careful and be fast enough. But I had moments when my knees would drop. Literally, I could not control my knees. And on a couple of occasions, there was, there was this particular customer, I remember, who came in and, and he both on both occasions, I, I just completely, as if you'd lose your consciousness for two, three seconds, my knees would drop. And, I, and I've learned later that, that what my body does at that low point is that it wants to lay down. It doesn't want to be vertical. And as opposed to the uh, zenith of the 24-hour clock, where you, you peak, you're performing at your best. Now, the point is when you are at the lowest and you need to lie down and you, your body needs to rest. Well, I had no choice but to be up. So then this customer is asking, you know, are you okay? What's happening? Because he, he noticed that somehow I wasn't there. And so you have that experience in the night. And then when you travel one or two hours to go home, uh, which is London being a global city with uh, long hours of commuting, you have to change so many transports. And so by the time you get home, I, sometimes I would have my meal, which I can't quite 
tell whether it was breakfast or dinner or you know midday for me it was it was you know cereals and breakfast and i couldn't wait to get back to sleep but even that sleep wasn't enough because the body was so exhausted never recovered on that one night off because at the market you'd only have sunday night off the rest of the night you have to be you have to be there so then the body would enter into on one hand into a mode which is what i mentioned earlier this body management where it readjusts to this night rhythm at the expense of losing your your sleep hours and and gradually i've lost about 14 kilos and and i was sleeping uh, on average uh, about 5 hours but that means i would have gone for say 11 to 16 hour shift on just two or three hours of sleep in the day. Add to it the fact that you sleep in the day when you know people around you are active. Add the fact that you have the daylight. And, and you know there's many components that feed into this new way of living. And if your body is not adjusting well, you're then exhausting your body and you, you start feeling the effects on it. And they are very unpleasant. But before I go into the unpleasantness, I think what I experienced during that year was the social isolation side of doing this work. And this social isolation means that you are not able to join people in the evening or you're not able to join people uh, for Christmas party. You're not able to join even for a simple evening dinner as I was sharing accommodation for other people and um, on my way out I see these these friends playing cards and waiting for their you know food to be ready and eat and I had to go to work and it was the first time when I I felt like I really wanted to throw that bike and not go to work and just sit with them play cards and, and have my evening meal but that would have been kiss goodbye my place at the market as I mentioned earlier you're expendable you don't turn up like it happened once my body was so exhausted that I, I simply could not turn up I had a sickness note from my doctor um, I went back to the market and I showed that to the manager he looked at it for a couple of seconds he thrown the paper as if like how dare you come to me tell me that you couldn't come to work I'm not interested in this and the, the reaction of my colleagues was was really striking here because um, I said, look, I have a seven days sick note. And, and they look at it and they say, what do you mean sick? I mean, what? Are you talking about AIDS here? You know, that's not sick. I mean, you made that on the computer, right? It's not a sick note. And, and why was striking is that I realized that people who um, work at this uh, market have never seen a sick note in their lives. And they were never even conceiving that you could actually turn and say, I have a sick note, by law I'm entitled to it, and therefore I should be able to stay at home and not be in, uh, sort of sanctioned, if you want, or have my job loss. And I guess that was striking in that sense. So, so then you have, so you have this physical exhaustion going on to this uh, unpleasantness, and, and then you have the social dimension, the social isolation effect, that after eight months uh, coming to, I, I guess it was somewhere around April, May, when I felt so quite depressed, I would say. I was, I, was, I was pushed. I pushed my body. I pushed my boundaries. I pushed my limits to a point where I said, I have to be careful because when you're in the field, you know, you supervise as much supervision you can get and guidance on it. You are there in the field and you're the one who has to, to decide to, uh, uh, up to which uh, point you can go, whatever intensity you, you, you can take emotionally, physically, psychologically. And, and I guess it was, a, it was a point where I had to decide when to stop doing this kind of uh, night ethnography in terms of participant observation, which is what I've been describing so far. I don't know if that answers. It, it, it answers a lot. I mean, there is so much to, to think about here, especially the knowledge that you were able to, to access, let's say, because... You accessed it with your ex own experience and your own body. And there are all these things you could have not felt or known just through interviews or other kinds of research. And then there's, of course, this separation that there is still between you and your 
work colleagues because for you this was research and you could get out of it while they they couldn't yes in that sense you could say i was privileged to to exit that kind of life but uh, i guess while we point this out what i have been uh, doing since i exited the field site in 2015 i have been committed to visibilizing this uh, world which is invisible to many day people so we're talking about day labor system right? so, so, so we have this daytime labor system designed to include somehow night shift uh, what i think it's causing uh, or rather further invisibilizes the night shift workers and their lives from the rest of the mainstream society and i guess this committed type of ethnography that, that i'm talking here about is that it continues long after you left the field site and in my case this is about the ways that i i found to engage mixed audiences with films so so you know the about the short film trilogy uh, in which i sort of tried to include uh, various aspects of, of night work and starting with Invisible Lives, this brainchild of a filmmaker and anthropologist who, who tried to capture both the lives who are up, so these Romanian night workers uh, working in London, but at the same time give a feel about London. So it's, it's quite picturesque in a sense. But as, as we move on to Nocturnal Lives, which was filmed uh, and includes uh, sequences of of me talking about the field work aside the words and and experiences of three of my co-workers i start to uh, go in depth into into what it is like to lead a nocturnal life and be a day sleeper and i guess the night ship spitfields the third one is is uh, as short as it is it it packs in it elements of homelessness and elements of, of physical exhaustion elements of of the night shift which is uh, which is this mode of living that is is stretching your your being in in so many directions and i guess the bottom line in this film is that no matter how many times this protagonist ali is trying to escape this environment because he's becoming a sort of a burden uh, for him he's still in, trapped in it because you also have to at some point i i supported him with uh, in this moment of homelessness uh, where his whole family experiences this situation which in which he has to sort of drop work for two nights and then deal with homelessness and after three nights and his family uh, move into a temporary accommodation so he, he has to sort of separate himself between the two and then eventually going back into and as soon as a homelessness episode is finished he's back into work continuing so which means you have no window to breathe and and sort of try and understand what's been happening and i guess this is the the visual component of of my research so I guess for me, visual anthropology is a little bit too much to say that I do visual anthropology as such. It's more like I use digital methods and they don't replace face-to-face -face interactions in my case, at least up to now, up to the pandemic times, but they complement in a way and they compensate for the lack of, lack of opportunities if you want to, to carry out in face-to-face fieldwork. So I guess in these conditions, digital methods, we're relying more and more on it. And using audiovisual methods in anthropological studies brings new possibilities for engagement with the critical public. And, and this is um, what uh, the, the short film trilogy is supposed to do, to engage those mixed audiences that include NGOs, activists, include the academics, include the, the critical public at large with topics that are very difficult to digest sometimes from you know, a journal uh, article. So one reason that you know could be perhaps taken out of it is that there's a combined methodological approach that symbolizes this close relationship between the visual and the touches that's you know touch senses that's what i've been trying to do yes i i really i really like that the um, i think what you said of course is important regarding the the visual part of it that it makes it more accessible but also what i think it does is 
just mediates another kind of uh, knowledge, you know, uh, knowledge about this work, knowledge about these people that do this work and what it feels like, because you can actually hear them tell their own stories. And it uh, it is also very fitting to, you know, signal how embodied this work is and how uh, it happens in this, in this context and in, in, in these very particular lives. Yeah, I'm glad that you you found it and resonate uh, in in this way because the idea is that we're surrounded by images. As Pink says, images are everywhere, and and the power of the of the image offers that space for interpretation and and multiple meanings and you know these fascinating endings. And unlike other methods, you know the the visual can allow for that space. And there's this core message that you know, we, we experience in the way the world surrounds us and, and with bodies and through senses. And, and at the same time, we, we use our eyes to receive and transmit this message. And, and the message is basically this window, if you, if you want to use a window into reality documented through research. You know, before a camera can capture it, you know, you have to go in the field, you have to sort of build up those relationships and engage with these people. And I think that one of the advantages of using visual as opposed to, say, interviews is that I found myself engaging with people while showing photos. And this, uh, these people were more like readily to participate in this photo shoot rather than give an interview. And I found that a, a great advantage. So that's, that's also important to bear in mind when, when you decide whether you want to complement uh, classical research methods with, with say, audiovisual recording. So then later you can rip the rewards of, of having this possibility of presenting and engaging audiences uh, visually long after you left the, the field site. I wanted to say that that's a very interesting insight in the way to do a research and understand that part of your choice was to make it more available to a larger public. What I was wondering, maybe I don't actually have a good segue for it, but I was wondering why this specific type of night work I understand. I understood from the text at some point. I think you kind of compared the labor from the Spitfield markets, the night work that happens directly in the city of London or its surrounding area, and you compare it to the work in the rest of the south of England. And you talk about care work, caretakers, and nurses, which also have night shift, and a big part of their labor is happens during the night. And I was wondering if you make a clear distinction between this kind of physical, let's call it physical, in quotation marks, labor that happens in places such as the Spitfield markets and the type of maybe, let's say, more of an emotional labor that happens with nurses, caretakers and maybe others. I see. I understand the question. The question now. Thank you. I guess uh, the, the approach... It's something that it, it's sort of revealed to me, if you want, following the field work. So initially when I went in, I went in with this, you know, uh, prepared and um, say theoretically armed with, with this concept, solidarity and competition. And I was interested in how groups engage in, and support one another and what sort of forms of, of solidarities are there. And I, I came to understand that the, the possibilities for solidarity are very fragile in this context. The, the fact is that they are so spent that anything else becomes secondary in terms of collective action of the, of the workers. And, and I, I guess this is sort of like how the field work revealed to me rather than what I went in to, to find out and, and explore. Uh, that's where the focus uh, was on this particular form of labor. But as Maria was also saying earlier, it's, it's still a sensorial experience. Even if you talk about people being up at night in call centers, that's also a physical experience if you, if you want, because you still have to be up at night. The call centers in India basically serve customers from, say, Australia or, or the North Americas, and they still sort of experience that you know, if you want hysteresis effect, it's it's a different sort of like before because they they engage with these customers who they never meet really the the other uh, you know 
part of the world and and because of this this uh, time zone and because of never actually engaging socially with with these people with whom they 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 form some sort of relationships over over time they they experience this hysteresis effect so then there's a, there's another form of of labor there which which is affected i mean so in a sense what i'm saying is that all night workers are subject to precarity whether you talk about uh, leaving carers or do you talk about cleaners and there's a certain element of, of precarity in so far as they need to stay alert during the hours when human bodies are supposed to rest and so but this precarity is further ag aggravated in the case of migrants I'm not saying there are no migrants in the care uh, or, or nursing it's quite the opposite you know there's there's a high percentage of migrants uh, serving and as the pandemic uh, has shown many migrants have been up and serving you know whether it's a bus driver or whether it's a, uh, it's a nurse or cleaner in a hospital you know they are up and, and providing those services and um, I guess what we want to see is is is, is more uh, awareness and acknowledgement not just for the essential frontline workers but on on a grander scale you know when society sleep sleeps who who remains awake right so we want to know more about that and and hence why i'm focusing more on this lower level of precarity because this is what i guess it's it's really important to point out that this this uh, kind of research on on precarity and focusing on on night work night work provides this temporal politics that that demonstrates the existence of different layers of precarity within the labor system and i tried to explain that this day labor system includes the night shift as opposed to having night shift on its own considered and the night workers considered as, as having this opposite uh, living on opposite rhythms to the rest of the society you get this night shift included into a labor system which has not accommodated the the say the the needs of these night shift workers and that's how you further invisibilize night workers and another way is that because for researchers is, is a difficult way of accessing that there's very little written even in the emerging field of night studies for example you know these night studies are not so useful in in basically getting insight in depth insight into the into the level of precarity of night workers and i guess this is where you have this intersection between because you happen to work at night and and be a migrant and do a manual low somewhat unfairly called low skill job you basically experience probably one of the lowest levels of layers of precarity yeah so then this precarity is, is aggravated in the case of migrants who are likely to accept these skill jobs more than locals would on precarious working terms right yeah, I just want to say thank you for the explanation and that makes a lot of sense. I understand the difference between the different types of night works. I was thinking about, um, for one, I've actually, I, I've, I didn't know there was this separate field called night studies. That's interesting. Maybe you could say something more about that. And after that, I was thinking maybe, yes, we could focus on how night work relates to migration, because of course, many of these night workers are migrants, especially I think in London where you researched, but I, I know, I, I imagine this must not be true everywhere. In Romania, for example, I, I do not know if there are so many of them are migrants. I see. So there's quite a, a, a few points that you're, you're raising there. So let's try and do them one by one. So the first one is the, the emerging field of nine studies, which focuses, it comes from a urban studies approach. And so you have studies who have been, uh, or researchers have been interested in, in uh, the nightlife aspects, interested in governance aspects. So you have the, you know, uh, policies around nighttime, nighttime space, darkness, security. What I found is that is that some somehow the focus on night work compared to say nightlife workers it's it's somewhat limited in the sense that i i see the effort on the cultural aspects on on sort of reviving the cultural the night culture two most affected say um 
work sectors are um, hospitality and accommodation in the UK. So overall, the, the workforce is somewhere, including somewhere like 3.2 million of, of workers doing uh, night shifts or, or evenings, some, some sort of um, uh, type of uh, unsociable hours of work stretching somewhere between evening, late evening and, and early into the night, or some would go up to 16 hours uh, of, of work. So uh, you, you get this, these sectors are in hospital and accommodation that have been suffering the most during the pandemic because many have been laid off and furloughed and, and uh, some were left at their own device because the government doesn't want to support them. And, and this is where these categories of essential and non-essential have been somewhat unhelpful because you get the frontline workers celebrate it and you get the so-called non-essential in hospitality and accommodation that are sort of disregarded if you want and left at their own device to, to make ends meet. And uh, not only that, but in the UK context, you have uh, Rick Schnack, I think is his name, the, the governor uh, who, who, who tells, you know, say, Sopranos, for example, who have invested 15, 16 years of their lives to, to train, uh, to, to retrain, basically. Yeah? So you, you're now telling the, the artists, you, you, you're telling the creatives to suddenly just turn around and, and do some job because, because there is no, because basically many independent artists and creatives have been, have been uh, suffering during the pandemic. And so you see this categorizing, which is very unhelpful. And, and in particularly when you talk about, um, you know, um, certain uh, work sectors who are relying heavily on, on migrants. So you're talking uh, around 18 to somewhere between 18 to 25 percent of, of foreign born in the UK who are support this infrastructure in, in transport, communication, as I mentioned earlier, cleaners in night hosp in hospitals, you know, night cleaners, offices, and so on, uh, who who basically have been there uh, before the pandemic, they're there during the pandemic, and will continue long after the pandemic. Uh, once we see it uh, through, um, and so you 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 have many. Uh, sectors who have been which which have been left out of, of this newly emerging night studies who, who who look at the night phenomena if you want more into the aspects of safety and, and cultural life than into aspects of work as if you could have night culture and night life without night work because for someone to have fun others have to be up and alert to work and provide that fun and that's that's feeding into you know social strata in the sense that you know some bodies are fostered and and taken care of and and are able to enjoy this night life and night culture and night museums and you name it who are up which are up and open uh, but not on their own uh, they are uh, supported by um, uh, a uh, huge number of you know of of night workers who provide these services so basically these are the the backstage workers if you want uh, and and what i've been trying to do is to sort of visualize these aspects by focusing on night work and and by if you want putting some faces uh, Onto onto these invisible uh, lives and 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 raising some voices because these voices seem to be further and further um, shut down or attempted to anyway. It's quite unpleasant to hear that for someone to uh, enjoy their nightlife, uh, you you have others who have to spend the nights and and provide that service and. Now, it's not as if to say is that there's something basically wrong in this. It's just that those who are up and alert providing the services, they should have access to decent working conditions. They should be treated accordingly and, and not as expendable as, as they are. And so you, you talk about 
terms and conditions of work. You're talking about uh, being paid overtime if they have to stay up overtime, being considered that they're way to work and back for the transport that they have to uh, use in the night hours. Uh, you, you have uh, elements of, of safety, as we know, dark uh, and darkness is perceived as a much more dangerous space. And, um, and therefore, we should consider these elements, but often, more often than not, they're not considered and they're expected to be met by the individuals themselves. You, you, uh, you're not investing in this workforce, as, as I found, this night workforce, unless you're talking about the stockbroker. So London Stock Exchange, for example, you have uh, people I'm, I, I spoke to and, and they are they are there because they want to learn the Asian market, for example. They're not there because they are pushed to be up and, and do the trading at night. So th th there's a difference here, and, and, um, and it's highlighted by this, this uh, working condition. So when it comes to you know, sustain, sustainable development um, goals agenda of the UN uh, 2030, you, you have uh, goal number eight, which, which states very clearly in terms of economic growth and, and decent working conditions, what the standards should be in terms of working hours and and uh, and, and salary and, and and conditions and night market, which is where I've I found it appalling in terms of working conditions. You had no place to to sit and have uh, your meal. If you're lucky, you had a 15 minutes break. Otherwise, you'd have had to carry on until the customers or, or the wave of customers left. You even had to report going to toilet. There's, there's different layers here, and, and I think these voices need to be heard and, and their faces need to be said. So, so somehow, somehow they enter into these mainstream uh, societies and the eyes and minds of the people that often function in the day as opposed to people who work at night. I think we could, there could be a, a whole discussion about the part in which you talked about the darkness and which is visible in one of your movies, if not in all of them. Actually, I think in all the three short films about the idea of safety uh, in the darkness and it's an aspect that they people don't actually think about or notice maybe on Friday nights, I guess, or something like that. But I would like to move towards a different point. I understand that you would like to start research in Romania cities and uh, maybe the night work in Romania. As you said previously, there are different layers of night work in general. But how would it be compared, maybe, if you thought about this already, work of a migrant in a foreign country, such as the migrants from everywhere in the world in London, compared to the night work here at the periphery of capitalism? Um, I, I think yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that as a Stau Bebe fellow, I, I, I began on, on sort of an exploratory phase of, of doing research at night in, in so-called siliconized smart cities, Romanian cities, you know, and, and uh, sort of like research sites. You can think of uh, larger cities like Bukurest, Brasov, Cluj, Napo, Kayash. You know, these these are the kind of cities where you have IT industries uh, sort of focused and 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 uh, functioning for quite a few years. And I I thought that would be it would be good to explore. But given this, you know, how COVID pandemic, you know, affected the way we function and we carry re research, carry out research, we also perhaps, if not going through a global economic recession and you know researching and in, in terms of emerging inequalities is more pertinent and particularly in regions where which attract uh, migrants and and uh, my presumption is that as we've noticed you know for example seasonal workers you know whether you have the borders closed or not if the uk or germany needs fruit speakers somehow those borders are open again Surprise, surprise. So you have this, this segment of, of migrants that the way they used to work before in the sense of, you know, going and, and picking fruits and, and vegetables in, in other countries. So from Romania to the UK or Germany, they, the work as they knew it continues for them, right? While as, as others, the work they knew it, it stopped because of the pandemic. And I guess these are challenges in, in uh, at both ends in a sense. So, you know, this, this uh, this exploratory phase of of this research is is, is is sort of 
like on a on a on a stop if you want at this stage i can't say much about this at this point but i'm hoping that once that we sort of come out of the, of of the way that sort of going in and out of lockdowns and and uncertainties i could move on and and uh, explore and perhaps make some connections between the heartland of capitalism and and the areas at the, at, at its periphery in that sense that perhaps make some links between the research and the way migrants experience night work in in places like london uh, or perhaps smaller cities so you have smaller capitals in the cities and and like like Cluj. so the idea is to to perhaps not so much make a comparative study but as i mentioned earlier at least i haven't come across but uh, make make some of these voices and uh, louder if they are in terms of which migrants are and what experiences they have in in, in working in, in in the smart cities. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, also you have this services manual low skilled workers who who provide the services and support this infrastructure, growing infrastructure if you want in in this so-called siliconized Romanian cities, the smart cities that attract migrants. I was thinking, uh, this was something that actually stuck, got stuck in my head when I was watching your, your movies. Let's call them movies for now, just shortly, <laughs> really short films. Some, some of the things the people said, and also, also what you said like um, a, few, a few minutes ago regarding how this work should be regulated. And uh, I remembered that some people said um, that that working at night was like living in a different world, and that it's how it's really tough on your body. And some someone said they can't smile during the day anymore, and someone else kept saying day sleep is not the same as night sleep. So I was thinking, does it? I mean, of course, it would help if this night work would be regulated, but. Must we really work at nights? I think this is the question I'm I'm thinking about. Is this really? Can we not imagine a world in which some people do not are not uh, are not made to be working this this work that is really alienating and, and tough on their bodies in itself? I guess that's um, that's a that's that's a very good question. But I don't see myself uh, giving a full answer to it. What what I can do is perhaps make reference to some some of the important literature by uh, art critic and historian John Crary, who wrote this book called 24-7 Ends of Sleep. And he makes reference to um, 18th century painter, I think it's Joseph Wright, who, who uh, depicts the lives of, of, of the uh, workers uh, as early as 18th century, somewhere about. And he, he describes this, these paintings, which are, which show that women and children were up and working by the candlelight. And so what actually this says is that this sort of today's capitalism is at an advanced stage from where it sort of started in, in that period when you had the cotton mills houses uh, in the British countryside as, as depicted by Joseph Wright in his paintings. And, and, and I guess... Can we envision today's capitalism without productivity, night productivity, uh, when the rhythm, if you want, is is to open up to 24-7? The societies have been moving in that direction for for a few centuries now, and, and it's hard to imagine that this will decelerate in a way and, and revert from, from it when... And not only that the 24 seven global cities have been functioning in this rhythm going back to the time when an octonalization began with with you know electric uh, light and and in big cities like london paris and and berlin it, it it's hard to imagine that that cities would decelerate What's more worrying is that a greater number of, of people involved in night work experience uh, more and more unfair, indecent uh, working conditions while, while this rhythm expands. It's, it's sort of an incessant rhythm of 24-7 of productivity and consumption that 
that happens, as I mentioned earlier, at the expense of, of somebody, a, a, a disinvestment, if you want, in bio, uh, you know, biopower, in, in Foucauldian terms, if you want, uh, explaining how, how this investment happens at the expense of disinvestment. Uh, so, so some some bodies for other bodies, if you know what I mean. So there's the there's a cost involved there, and this cost is experienced in in ways that uh, are described in, in the literature by Sharma, for example, who who calls this this expendable bodies. You have Tanya Lee who calls them disposable lives, precariousness. It's it, it's a, at a depth and a, and and are um, of a magnitude that. Not that it didn't exist, but I think it's magnified by several degrees when you are migrant night workers in a global city, for example. Okay, so we cannot imagine having capitalism without night work. But can we imagine something other than capitalism that also doesn't include night work? Uh, something of the kind. What do you have in mind here when you ask this question? Why it might come after capitalism? I mean, a sort of post-capitalism. I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, to perhaps go into that direction because I I see it as so consuming the way it is now, and it's hard for me to imagine something uh, as sort of a, a, an after. Perhaps also because my my focus has not been so much in, into exploring the after you know when you embed it into this kind of research is is quite consuming for the researcher as well and and i guess if i were to answer this question then i would have to bring back the body in the into the discussion i can only i can only uh, talk in 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 this um terms of of sort of circadian and post circadian capitalism what I've been talking about uh, so far, it's, it's a way of, of talking in, in, in respect and disrespect to the physiological rhythms that capitalism has, has uh, sort of went from one phase, that circadian phase, where uh, it had some respect for uh, the bodies and human life in the sense that Previous generations, they would be, uh, you know, their time would be sort of, if you want, structured into, you know, education, work, retirement. So you, you had some structure, some idea of what your life would look like. And you would have this respect uh, in terms of awake and sleepness, in terms of work and rest, which in this post circadian if you want, I don't know if we can call it um, post-capitalism era, but but in this post-Sicardian capitalist sort of phase, there's no respect for that. There, you can you can look at um, in in terms of labor of the, the flex security, you know, these terms which which expect that you would ever flexible you're 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 ready to move you're ready to migrate you're ready to you have to be there um, at flexible hours on insecure work contracts and and your body going back to the this this bodily experience um completely disrespected so you, the degrees of embodied precariousness in this post circadian capitalist era is magnified by by several degrees and and i guess one of the things that we haven't been talking much is the way that that workers use a bodily kind of knowledge to survive the night and to perform on one hand in this post-industrial countries it's on one hand it's sort of night work it's celebrated but uh, at the same time, night workers are considered expendable. I doubt that there, there, there is any going back uh, in the sense of the times when there were some respect for this circadian rhythms, uh, where there's no interference between the private and the, and the public life. Uh, I think at the moment where we experience this, there is this invasive, if you want, invasive encroachment on the private sphere of, of, of the worker and there's no time for 
social family life if you want uh, uh, there's there's no time for rest there's only time to produce and consume and therefore the worker needs to be more flexible than ever and and he needs to provide this this bodily labor so the worker's bodily capital is is a threat in a way because what i've been talking about in terms of precariousness at the uh, night market is that this bodily capital is 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 exhausted is is running out and the workers possibilities to collectively organize and and demand their rights and to collectively perhaps em- envisage a new way or, or another life for them it's low because that's a secondary concern in terms of uh, their survival so that bodily knowledge that i introduced is that the the knowledge that these workers have in in terms of performing bodily performance and bodily discourse it's a, it's all concentrated on surviving this night shift as opposed to expand in terms of the social relations in terms of cooperation which which some some studies out there by Richard Sennett shows that in terms of cooperation that can also be established in in sort of bodily terms in terms of physical labor when you look at the, the craftsman the book that he wrote and on on craftsman and how he he explores capabilities of of cooperation and 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 socialities among these kind of workers but when you're a migrant and you work uh, in highly precarious environments and you have to be there six nights a week be happy that you have a few hours that you spend with a partner or family on the only day off you you can't think of these forms of cooperation or or show some solidarity i mean there's this uh, sort of insight that that i'm absorbed by uh, in a, in a way <laughs> the way that that richard senate puts it is that people they work together but not with one another and I, I think this sums up very well uh, where where cooperation breaks and and possibilities for solidarity are more and more fragile in these highly precarious environments. For the researcher, it's also very difficult, I would say, to explore this side unless you have the opportunity, as I did, to be embedded in that field for such long period. Because nowadays with so little money for research or rather long ethnographic research, you, you think in bleeds field work or none because of the pandemic condition. So then you're, you're relying on online digital methods that we've been talking about. Yes, yes, it, it, was, uh, it made sense. It makes a lot of sense what you're saying, although it's not so good to hear, but it's coherent. <laughs> it's depressing, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's often I had this... this uh, this, this, you know, in moments of exhaustion, as I mentioned, when you have this point where you have to decide whether you can go ahead, whether you, you know, it's like, perhaps I should have researched nightlife. At least I would have gone into a club and have some good fun mm-hmm. while I was researching. But no, I took this highly precarious um, uh, field, if you want, uh, and, and doing research. But nevertheless, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been, very rewarding uh, and i guess there's a there's a there's a buddhist saying that comes to mind uh no mud uh, no lotus and and i guess what i could add to that is that the lotus is in the mud and and in terms of some of my peers they said you know why do this research why why someone's suffering and i guess there's no blooming without suffering and that's my attempt to turn it into a positive note <laughs> <laughs> i was actually thinking of adding something a bit defeatist in the end actually i i can think of a moment in our I don't know, common history since the beginning of agricultural production in, in which night work was not somehow necessary i just feel like in the modern times it just has been exacerbated to a point in which well, you know yourself. <laughs> I don't even know how to express it in words. I don't uh, work nights that often to actually think about how how important the impact of night work is 
for the good working uh, of the modern consumerist capitalist system as we know it and in the system in which we actually live in and I think each and every one of us have um, benefited from the night work of others unfortunately there is no escaping from it what my what my fear is is because because we have examples I think we can look around us and we, we don't necessarily need to speak strictly of, of night work. We can, I mean, what amazes me lately is, is because of this um, uh, sort of abundance, if you want, of platforms and online methods. I, I sometimes get email from HR at 11 p.m. and uh, could be in some other countries, nine or 10 or uh, plus 10 hours. So you, you, you get this, uh, you, you, you get this uh, sort of intrusion, if you want, you know, with, with emailing and, and being on so many different platforms to communicate, I guess, if not night work, uh, sort of like if you, if you were to, I mean, we anecdotally here, we, we sort of like speculating that perhaps not strictly speaking in terms of night work, but, but the work day, if you want, stretches slowly and gradually towards evening and, and even late night in terms of sort of being available. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. 24 seven available. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be structured by this uh, 10 PM, 10, uh, 6 AM, or, you know, this, strictly speaking night shift yeah i was wondering that it's simply a part of globalization and you have to be, be available to the person on the other side of the planet literally from the communications industry i would say the communication economy you literally have to talk with people on the other side of the planet and they they might be more important than yourself so you have to stay up for them not them for yourself so kind of like that yes i guess that's what i would have to add here and i believe we should finish slowly if you have any ending words or if you uh, already said them i don't know maybe finish on a more positive note i guess i guess more um, more more to do with with the kind of research that i've been doing one one thought that i have is it's we, we we're talking about this message you know and and the kind of committed ethnography that that i have been engaging with so this kind of engaged way of of visibilizing night work putting out messages for uh, the people in the backstage and and i guess this message as i mentioned is is this window into reality that is documented through research and we shouldn't underestimate the advantage of, of digital methods to use you know because because you're as a researcher you you enter the field your your uh your camera is capturing you you're recording you know there's there's lives out there and they they stay outside of the film and and they they represent it to an audience and, and, and the lives long after the researchers left the film and, and they're important. So I guess I'd like to close with the words of sociologists um, of, of migration and ethnic studies, um, Marco Martiniello, who argues that mainstream research approaches uh, to migration and are too often, they're too often policy driven. And I think it's important that to encourage researchers using visual methods in migration studies. And that's because in, in complex way, if you want, it's, it's, a, it's a set of very intricate uh, issues, social issues, and it's it, migration I'm talking here, right? So it's, it's a set of this, you know, intricate social, uh, social issues. And, and, and it's one that's forming um, total, you know, social phenomenon that we call migration. I think visual methods have a big say in this growing field of migration. And, and in terms of, you know, night work with, with this invisible lives uh, spent at night and post-industrial societies, it's important to understand that, you know, when society sleeps, they are awake. They are there to, with the health or economic crisis, they, they continue providing and supporting this infrastructure. 
and 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 it's important that we 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 consider that night work it's not included in the day night work stands on its own as part of um a labor system which is more inclusive uh, and when I say inclusive, I mean inclusive of these lives spent at night while society sleeps. Um, thank you. Thank you for all, all of the talk. It was, it was really interesting. And I, I think it's, it's, like you said, it's so often overlooked and yet it is so essential, this night work. And it, it's really good to talk about it and to bring it forth and uh, also to have this visual uh, well, we don't have the visual here, but to know that there are your your films are can be viewed and it it really brings forth a, a different way of engaging and knowing this. Thank you for listening to Contrasense. Today's guest was Dr. Julius Caesar McGuire. This episode was produced by Maria and Caro. Opening and closing soundtrack by Kind Studios. Recorded in our homes. If you like the episode, you can support us by donating to our Patreon. You'll find the link below. More about us on our Facebook page and you can listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes and Spotify. We're looking forward to your feedback and questions at contrasense at protonmail.com.